is Nikki Johnston, and I'm with Transition Advisors. Our webinar today is Keys to Your Partnership Agreement with items unique to the Midwest and Southwest. Before we begin, we'll need to cover a few important items. First, please close any other programs running on your computer. This will help to ensure quality presentation and reduce any audio issues. Transition Advisors LLC is a proud and approved sponsor on the National Registry of CPA Sponsors per NASBA. We're also registered with the state of Texas. So in order for you to receive your one CPE credit for today, you must complete two requirements. First, you must participate in three out of the four polling questions throughout the presentation. And please note that GoToWebinar does monitor your participation in these polls. Next, you'll need to complete an online evaluation. This will appear on your screen immediately following the webinar. So once we end, be sure not to close your browser window just yet. You'll want to complete that online survey before you do so. Once these requirements are met, the certificate will be sent to you within 10 business days. In order for you to fully participate in today's webinar, please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the GoToWebinar control panel. It should be visible on the right-hand side of your screen. There's an orange arrow near the top, and you can use that to minimize the panel if you'd like. During the presentation, all of our participants are muted, but you can contact us by using that question box that's toward the bottom of the panel. Just type your question in the box and click send. Questions are important to us, and time permitting, our presenter will answer all of the questions at the end of today's presentation. Finally, I'd like to remind you that Transition Advisors offers a free one-hour CPE webinar each month. Our upcoming topics include internal success session readiness assessments, valuing accounting firms, and growing your firm through new practice niches. You can see the dates there on the screen, and you can view a complete list of webinars, including registration links for each of them in the CPE courses section of transitionadvisors.com. Now, as a quick reminder, you received a reminder email, and in that there was a link to today's presentation. I've also just sent that link to you via the chat function, so if you'd like to download a PDF of the slides and follow along with Russ, you're welcome to do so. Now at this point, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today's session. Russ Best is the Managing Director of Transition Advisors. Thank you so much for attending, and I hope you enjoy today's webinar. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, we're going to spend probably about the next hour together, and hopefully we'll impart some useful information to you all. Uh, as we first start here, just let me introduce myself. Uh, I am Russ Best. I'm a partner with Transition Advisors. We are a national consulting firm that deals exclusively with public accounting firms. Uh, we provide a full range of services, particularly M&A type activities. Uh, right now, probably about 70% of our revenue stream is through traditional merger and acquisition type services. Uh, the remaining 30% uh, is consulting directly with public accounting firms. Uh, of that consulting, I will tell you that the percentage of consulting engagements we have specifically dealing with partnership and shareholder agreements is growing phenomenally. So this is a very hot topic right now. Uh, also, I would like to tell you my firm has been around since, since 2006. Uh, our president is Joel Senkin, who is out of our New York office. Uh, Joel is very well known on the East Coast and becoming very well known throughout the country. Uh, Joel is a prolific writer. I would be absolutely shocked if you all have not seen his articles virtually monthly in AICPA publications. Our CEO is Terry Putney, uh, who resides with me here in Kansas City. Uh, this is our administrative headquarters. Uh, I would urge you, after the presentation is done, visit our webpage. Uh, we have hundreds of articles uh, that deal with public accounting firms. Uh, Russ, I believe we've lost your audio. I can see the slides okay, but I can't hear you. I apologize, everyone, for the technical difficulty. Give us just a moment, and we'll have Russ dial back into the line.
Hello, are we back? Yes, Russ, we can hear you now. Thanks so okay. much. Sorry I about that, everyone. So sorry, I don't know what happened. Okay. Well, let's start out. I, uh, we're going to talk about the key elements of the partnership agreement, and my partners and I believe very strongly that there is no other document uh, that can protect a firm better or prepare a firm better for growth uh, as they continue on their life cycle. Uh, some of the key elements of a partnership agreement uh, obviously uh, tends to be compensation, and we'll spend some time on that. It also deals predominantly with defining and allocating equity uh, to the equity partners, if you will. It de deals with governance issues. It also deals with retirement and other terminations. It deals with partner admission and then other matters. Perhaps one of the most telling features of a partnership agreement is the way that it defines and deals with retirement and terminations of the partner group. At that point, Nikki, why don't we just do the first polling question and then we'll get into the details. Okay, our first polling question is on the screen. Take a moment to answer here. This question is, does your firm have an owner agreement? And your options are yes, and it's signed by all owners. Yes, but not all owners have signed it. No, but we need one. No, and we aren't sure we need one. So just a reminder, you do need to do three of the four polling questions in order to get the CPE credit. So we'll give everyone just another moment to select their answer before we close the poll. Okay, Russ, that's nearly everyone who's answered. Uh, just over half, 56% say yes, and it's signed by all owners. Another 22% say no and we need one, and the remaining 22% say no and we aren't sure that we need one. Okay. Uh, for those of you who aren't sure, I hope this kind of enlightens you and urges your firm to get one in place because it is probably the ultimate protection for you and your partners. Uh, let's talk about different types of compensation plans. And one of the things that we wanted to make this presentation a little bit unique was identifying areas that are unique to the Midwest and Southwest. Uh, one of the things that I will tell you is that within the Midwest Southwest, I'm finding a, a relative movement more and more towards compensation plans that are defined outside of the partnership agreement. Uh, within the partnership agreement, obviously, uh, it deals with the proper split of profits between uh, equity partners, if you will. But there are many different types of compensation plans. The seven that are most prominently recognized by the AICPA include equal compensation, seniority, a formula, cross-evaluation, equity-based, committee-based, and leader-based. Uh, each one of these we're going to go into in a little bit more detail. Uh, the Equal compensation plan is very often used for new partnerships, if you will. Uh, very often when we're talking about a 50-50% ownership, particularly. Uh, we believe that in the early stages of the firm, this does promote uh, collegiality. Uh, it requires substantially equal contribution uh, to be su sustainable, though, uh, within the firm. Uh, long term, however, the equal compensation plan very often fails to promote high performance uh, within and among the partnership group. The second type of compensation plan is, is most particularly equity-based. I would tell you probably up to five years ago, uh, most compensation plans that I saw within firms were equity-based. Uh, they're predominantly used with newer partnerships also. Uh, equity always enters the into some fashion in compensation, but it's standalone, we're finding that it's, it's changing radically. We find that this also promotes short-term stability for the firm, but it requires substantially static contribution to be sustainable. And what I mean by that is basically equal uh, productivity on behalf of the partners. Long-term, we find that this often fails to promote high performance, and it can easily get out of balance. Uh, as you can imagine. The third compensation plan is seniority. Uh, this is largely based on tenure. 
It's very similar to an equity-based, as very often we find in firms, the longer uh, a partner is within the firm, the larger their equity uh, base becomes. Uh, equity normally accumulates based on that seniority. Uh, this is also, uh, can be called a unit-based type plan, very similar to a stock shareholder ownership, if you will, uh, where the units accumulate over time. Uh, in the firms where I, I still find some seniority-based compensation, I'm finding that uh, units very often are rewarded for performance and taken away for lack of performance, so that can change over time. Uh, obviously, this form of compensation plan tends to reward past performance rather than current performance. What we prefer, quite frankly, is a pure formula uh, type compensation plan. Very often we are beginning to recommend that this type of compensation plan be used as apart from and separate uh, from the partnership agreement. Obviously it's our dream, it's the accountant's dream. It gives us something to to track and reward against. This usually relies very heavily on predetermined objective measures. What I'm finding more and more, particularly in Texas firms, uh, that incentive systems for partner comp are almost changed on an annual basis now in the majority of firms that I deal with. Uh, this also tends to promote clarity and certainty. Uh, many firms that I find that use a formula type based uh, performance or incentive system uh, tie very closely to the strategic plan and strategic direction uh, that the firm has set through objective measurement criteria. Uh, we also find that this leaves out the hard to measure or very subjective elements of performance that very often leads uh, to some type of uh, concern uh, amongst the partner team. Uh, this tends not to be team oriented though. It very often, depending on the way that you have defined your incentives in the formula, it can, it can be manipulated by the astute accountants that we are. Another form of compensation plan is the cross evaluation plan. Uh, this really relies on the partners working together to evaluate each other and coming to an agreement on what type of performance and compensation they may see. Uh, this appears, uh, it, gives the, it gives you the appearance of fairness and more democratic. It does require knowledge of the partner's contribution. However, this does tend to lump most partners into an average rating, uh, which tends to cause some concern within firms. This also tends to avoid hard discussions about who really uh, is performing within a firm. Very often, uh, firms are dependent on the managing partner or leader-driven type compensation plans to decide. Uh, I find this very predominantly in firms that have grown up around a single uh, founding partner, if you will, who has added partners over the years. Uh, very typically, that managing partner decides uh, the compensation that will be paid to the individual partners. It, it does require a very strong managing partner. Uh, it is the most flexible. Uh, it can be very effective in a firm with a strong managing partner. However, in a closed system, uh, one that tends to share has open book type management, this can lack the transparency that very often can lead to mistrust or lack of the needed feedback from other, other, some of the other partners, if you will. We're finding more and more within large, large firms uh, that the compensation plan is very largely managed uh, by a committee, if you will. Uh, this, I would say, probably is, becomes predominant in firms once their partnership ranks uh, become more than 10 or 15, if you will. Uh, it also works well when there is not a shared knowledge of all the partners' contributions. Uh, it does allow flexibility and more fair vetting of issues. Uh, however, it can also be deemed to lack transparency. And in some cases, depending on how well the committee works together, it can be somewhat inefficient. Now, one of the things that I will tell you, and we believe very strongly, 
is that the type of compensation plan that your firm chooses to endorse uh, very heavily uh, influences the culture that you wish to create uh, within the firm. I have many firms, particularly in the Texas market right now, who modify their partner compensation plans almost on an annual basis. Obviously, this takes trust, uh, but it also tends to have them march very closely to the strategic direction or strategic plan that the firm has set. Uh, it very often is very difficult to move uh, from one type of compensation plan to another. Uh, but I think once the strategic direction is established, the need to establish specific incentives per year, uh, this type of system does become very effective over time. Uh, I will reiterate once again that what we are finding, particularly in the Midwest and Southwest, is that compensation is handled apart from the partnership or shareholder agreement. Let's move to equity, if we could. Uh, equity, obviously, uh, is something that's close to all of our hearts. This relates very closely to the equity line on our balance sheets. Uh, it also is a very often uh, interprets to the amount of ownership per individual partner. Very often, equity is a primary piece of the compensation model. It is very important for many firms in the way that they term, determine profit sharing. Uh, it also is used uh, in a decision-making type mode. I find many firms have voting rights in direct proportion to the ownership percentages that they have. Uh, also, equity is a primary basis uh, for internal buyouts or buy-ins by new partners, if you will. Uh, it also is very closely uh, monitored and reviewed anytime an external buyout is considered also. Now what you will hear me refer to throughout this pres presentation is two types of equity. Uh, the first is what we all know is tangible equity. That very often relates directly to the capital accounts of the equity-based partners. I also refer to intangible equity. Uh, that relates more to the value of a partner buyout. It very often can relate to the book of business or revenue stream of the firm itself. So there is two types of equity that we consider, particularly in partner succession and retirement type scenarios. Tangible equity, their capital account, and intangible equity, the book of business or revenue stream that the firm may have. Now, what does equity really mean? Uh, one of the things that we are becoming more and more aware of is that there are consequences to too much equity being owned by one partner. Uh, I find many, many situations, particularly in firms that have less than 10 partners, where you may have a majority ownership partner owning more than 40 or 50 percent uh, of the capital of the firm. Uh, this does have, tend to have an adverse effect on succession planning. When you are looking to buy out or retire a partner that owns 40 to 50 percent or more equity in the firm, this can be quite a strain on the firm from a longevity standpoint. Uh, it also uh, does tend to have an effect on internal transfers of ownership. Obviously, every time you bring in a new partner, the equity position or ownership position of the existing partners tends to be diluted, if you will. Equity in itself also has a major impact on mergers and sales, and we'll talk about how we deal with some of those. Uh, very often, uh, what you attempt to do, particularly in a merger, is transfer your equity into the combined firm, uh, dependent on the equity structure of the, the upstream merger, uh, firm, if you will, uh, you can find some traumatic results very often uh, in a merger type situation. We also find that there's a very close interrelationship of compensation and value, particularly to the ultimate succession of a partner, if you will. 
And at that point, Nikki, let's move to our second polling question, if we may. Okay. Our second polling question is the number of owners in your firm. You'll see your options up there include I'm a sole pr proprietor. We have two to four owners, five to nine, or ten or more. We'll give everyone about 30 seconds to select their answer. And again, just a reminder that you do need to complete three polling questions in order to receive your CPUs today. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. The results are visible there. 63% of the folks on today's call are sole proprietors, Russ, and the remaining 38% have two to four owners. Okay, very good. So we're dealing with firms of a size that I deal with quite a bit, and I will try through the remainder of the presentation to kind of zero in on, on you all as opposed to some of the larger firms that we deal with. Uh, why don't we talk about the different type of partners that we find uh, within firms. Uh, obviously, every firm has some level of equity partner. Uh, the larger a firm gets, they may have a delineation between a senior partner and a junior partner uh, that very often not only relates to their compensation, but also to responsibilities. Uh, we also find more and more uh, that income or non-equity partners are generally accepted and promoted within firms. Uh, there obviously is reasons for this. Uh, anytime we as equity partners uh, are challenged to bring in a new partner, we know our ownership position will be diluted to a certain extent. Uh, however, there is a need, particularly from a client relationship model, uh, to have partner equivalent type positions. This very often takes the form of an income or non-equity partner, which we'll talk about in more detail. Uh, I'm also finding more and more uh, that firms may bring in contract type partners. Uh, these are partner equivalent uh, type positions within the firm. Uh, they are very often used for, for specific niches, if you will. Uh, I find a predominance of contract partners in litigation support uh, and valuation type work as opposed to a full equity partner. Uh, something else we're seeing, particularly with the aging uh, of CPAs uh, within our country right now, that many retiring partners may become an of counsel or emeritus pot, uh, partner with the firm and basically be treated as a consultant, albeit a partner equivalent type partner. What we're finding today also is that, again, 80% of firms over 20 mil use income partners, if you will, as a position within their firm. Uh, most of these firms do view uh, an income partner, a non-equity partner, uh, as being on their path to equity ownership, if you will. Well, uh, those who are taking part in this presentation right now with less than 10 partners, uh, this is something that you could consider uh, to test, if you will, uh, whether an individual is ready for equity partnership. Uh, I am finding many firms uh, have income partners at permanent status, uh, particularly in smaller firms uh, who are getting into uh, niches such, a, such as information technology, uh, other areas uh, where the professional may not be a CPA, uh, an income or non-equity partner could be permanent uh, within a firm. Uh, the non-equity or income-based partners is also a very effective tool uh, to use in upstream mergers in particular. Uh, what many of you are aware of, I'm sure, is that the larger the firm, the bigger there is a tendency uh, to have the size of the book of business that a partner may be expected to maintain uh, as a requirement for equity partnership. Uh, for example, uh, if a firm is merging into a large firm, if the firm merging in has an average book of business typically beneath a million dollars uh, in revenue stream, uh, and the firm that you would be merging into or an upstream merger 
requires at least a million dollars of revenue stream or more, the income or non-equity partnership role is definitely a way to deal with this, and we're finding it more and more. Let's kind of switch gears to governance. Uh, one of the things that a partnership or shareholder agreement uh, very specifically defines uh, is how much uh, a decision-making capability an individual partner, managing partner, uh, junior partner, or what have you can make. Uh, they're very often, particularly in things that need to be voted upon within a firm, you will find terms used as, such as a unanimous uh, type support for a decision, a super majority, which typically represents 75% or more of the ownership position of the firm, and then a simple majority, uh, meaning over 50% in all voting manners. Very often, a governance, particularly financial commitments to be taken on by the firm, is, is actually defined as part of the partnership agreement. Now, by way of example, uh, a supermajority may be required uh, to admit a new partner. A supermajority could be used also to make any expenditure, let's say, in excess of five or $10,000. A simple majority uh, may be made for just expenses in excess of a certain amount, but less than, let's say, $10,000. Uh, a unanimous decision very often is required uh, anytime we're talking about a dis dissolution of the firm, sale of the firm, or merger of the firm. The one thing that we will tell you is that there are definite pros and cons related to unanimous decision requirements. Uh, I think any of us who have served on committees or have equal partnerships within our firm know that very often a decision could be actually log jammed or held up as a result of failure uh, to get that unanimous type decision made. So in most cases, we suggest consider other things other than unanimous decisions in your partnership agreement. Let's move to basically the retirement or succession of our partner group. Uh, many firms come to us and, and ask about how we feel about mandatory retirement age. Uh, what we are finding is mandatory retirement ages uh, within firms with the aging of the average CPA uh, is actually the man if there is a mandatory retirement age in place uh, that age is escalating if you will uh, I used to talk to many firms that had a mandatory retirement age of s between 60 and 65 we're finding many firms today and this is particularly in the Midwest and, and Southwest that are expanding that retirement age to be in excess of 65 years old now, should your agreement include a mandatory retirement? I obviously believe there are pros and cons to this. Uh, basically, if you have a growing firm uh, with the realization that you're going to have to provide a career stream uh, for the young potential partners coming up and a elder partner, if you will, uh, is holding a place as a partner and, and prevents a new partner from advancing, that could be a reason to use a mandatory retirement age. One of the things that I will tell you is predominantly in the Midwest and Southwest right now what I'm finding is firms that do have a mandatory retirement age, regardless of what that is, the mandatory retirement age requires that the partner step down as a partner very often the equity partner is at that point uh, having their equity or their capital account being bought out and at the same time they may become an income partner continuing to work within the firm provide a career path for the younger partners and share in the profitability through uh, objective type criteria so I think it's up to you all uh, there are definitely pros and cons to that One of the most important pieces, and very often my partners and I are asked, how can we protect our firm best? 
And one of the tools that we have found to be most effective is this thing called vesting. And basically, what I am finding in Texas, uh, to a certain extent, is more movement probably within the last three years than I've seen before of partners actually leaving a firm, uh, taking a book of business with them, and as a result, wounding seriously uh, the firm that they were leaving. Uh, very often, this this happens within the newer partner ranks. <coughs> Excuse me, it has been our experience. One of the ways to protect the firm uh, from this is requiring a newer partner to vest. Typically, vesting applies directly to what I referred to earlier, and that is their claim on the intangible value of leaving the partnership. <coughs> Excuse me. Very often what I find is that vesting is a cultural thing within a firm. Uh, I just completed a partnership agreement uh, with a firm that is very progressive. Uh, they are growing very rapidly. They are looking to attract uh, large firm partners, if you will. Uh, the way they are doing that is not only through compensation, but also through very rapid vesting. Uh, in this firm's case, they insisted on 100% vesting after five years as a partner with the firm. Now, that won't work in every firm, as you know. What I'm finding more and more is vesting has a direct impact on the tenure, if you will, of partners within the firm. The higher your vesting requirement, the higher the tenure or the chance that a partner will stay on board. <coughs> Excuse me. I have just completed a partnership agreement or in the final stages where the vesting basically will not be fully vested until 10 years. Now what does that mean? Basically as a new partner comes in, in this firm's case, they are required to spend a minimum of six years as a partner before they have any claim whatsoever. Uh, on the intangible value of whatever buyout they would have. Uh, that is then expanding from six years to 10 years at 20% a year to 100% vesting after 10 years. Uh, we believe, my partners and I, that this is very appropriate uh, to keep the younger partners within a firm. Uh, typically, the vesting period, on average, uh, we find to be around 10 years. Uh, I have also dealt with a firm that has a 20-year requirement for 100% vesting in the intangible value of the firm. So vesting is a very powerful tool. Uh, if you are experiencing or fear that you could lose a partner who can take a book of business, vesting is a very powerful tool to keep that from happening. Now let's talk about the mes methods of valuing equity, if you will. Now, in this case, uh, valuing equity, I'm talking about particularly intangible equity. The capital count of a partner tends to speak for itself. Very often, the capital buyout upon a partner's retirement, termination, or withdrawal uh, will be paid to that partner with regardless. Typically, the capital account is expected to be paid out over, let's say, three to 10 years in most firms' cases. What we're talking about on this slide right now is the intangible value. How do you value the firm and an individual partner's share of that upon their retirement? Uh, we have seen methods used based on book of business. This is probably the most predominant. Uh, also valuing intangible uh, based on their equity position in the firm or percent of ownership. More and more within the Midwest and Southwest, we're also finding that firms are gravitating towards a compensation-based uh, retirement model, if you will. And then, of course, there are hybrids of this left and right. Nikki, at this point, let's take our third polling question, if we may. Okay, I've just launched our third polling question. I believe our approach to valuing our owner's interest in the firm is, your options are fair and affordable, fair, but I'm not sure we can afford the buyout, not fair because it's too rich, not fair it's too low, or 
not applicable. We don't have an agreement. So we'll give everyone a few seconds to read through those and select their answer. And just a reminder, this is our third of four, and you do need to answer three of the polling questions to get your CPE credit today. Okay, just one more second for those who haven't yet voted. And I'll go ahead and close the poll. The results are visible there. 56% chose that last answer because they don't have an agreement. 33% say fair and affordable, and then 11% fair, but I'm not sure we can afford the buyout. Okay, very good. Thank you, Nikki. Whoops, moved ahead too fast. Hold on. All right, so let's talk about some statistics, if you will. Uh, based on the 2012 PCPS succession survey study, uh, the valuation methodologies, and again, this is directly tied to what I am referring to as intangible equity or value of the firm. For those with a management agreement, typically 37% use a multiple of equity as the tool to value that intangible piece. 16% use managed book of business. 22% use a multiple of compensation, and of all these percentages, that is the one that is growing, and 25% use something else. One of the things that I would encourage you to keep in mind is that partner succession can be a very traumatic affair, uh, obviously, for a firm. Uh, one of the things that we are very cognizant of is we're asked to help draft a partnership agreement for firms is to fairly reward the retiring partners <coughs> for their sweat equity, while at the same time leaving enough capital within the firm uh, where the remaining partners can be properly compensated and properly motivated uh, to continue to lead the firm into longevity. Uh, I don't think any of us would expect uh, remaining partners after our succession to be forced to either borrow or step, take a step backward in their compensation to do that. Obviously, this would have a dramatic impact on the firm. Let's talk about when a partner does relieve a firm, leave a firm, goes into succession or retirement. Basically, that available capital is used for a number of different things. And we're going to talk about this in more detail. Typically, a partner's salary or compensation is the available capital left within the firm to do a number of different things. This amount is usually used to pay the retiring partner. It's used to cover the cost of the replacement resource for that partner. And there is also should be some cushion there uh, to allow the remaining partners to assume further obligations and the extra work now that they will be required. A specific example of this is, is going to present, be presented as follows. We, and this is an actual live firm that we have dealt with in the past. A retiring partner at 275000 uh, in compensation, $120,000 to replace his resource, his or her resource, that leaves $155,000 of excess cash within the firm to do that. An example, and again, this is from a firm that we have dealt with in the, in the not too distant past. Basically, this was a firm's volume was about 1.9 in annual revenue. The retiring partner's equity was 45%. That partner's comp and benefits equated to about 275,000 and he had a capital account of 175000 The payout of retirement over five years, basically applying their equity percentage to the firm's book of business, 1.9 mil, divided by five was equivalent to $171,000 per year. The cost of that replacement resource is 120000 In the following example, you can see very specifically that the impact of this type of a succession or partner buyout could have crippled this firm had they allowed it uh, to continue. 
uh, taking into consideration their terms, which was to pay off the capital account immediately and pay out the retirement over five years. This scenario resulted in 191,000 of negative cash flow in the first year and 16,000 of negative cash flows in years two through five. How did they remedy the situation? Basically, they put into place a, an alternative plan, <clears throat> which largely uh, required that the capital account of the partner be bought out over five years, and the retirement was paid out over 10 years as opposed to five. Obviously, this had a very dramatic effect on the cash flow of the firm. Another way that they could have dealt with uh, that discrepancy, if you will, but was through adjusting the multiple. In the example that I showed you, that firm was using a one-time multiple of intangible value for the firm. Now, given those things, there was a dramatic impact on the cash flow of the firm itself. As opposed to negative cash flow, all of a sudden in the first year, in this case where the capital account is paid out over five years, in the first five years, positive cash flow was roughly $35,000. Over years six through 10, it became close to 70,000. Now a good rule of thumb that we tend to use, particularly with the intangible value or the retirement buyout, not the capital account, is that that positive cash flow should be a minimum of 25% of the available cash flow for the firm. Now just some particulars or statistics uh, as far as internal valuation. Uh, basically those who use a multiple of equity or book of business from a firm, again this is from the PCPS study, uh, less than 10% of the firms used more than 100% of revenues or more than a one-time multiple. Over 40% used 100% of the revenues, and almost 30% used between 75 and 100%. On the other side, again, we're gravitating, I believe, to a compensation model uh, for buyout. 40% uh, of the firms in the poll used three times earnings. And when I say this, that would be three times their average compensation, typically for the last five years, to be paid out over five years, but that multiple would be three times. So their average compensation for the last five years times three paid out over the next 10 years. About 15 use, 15% 15 use two to one and a half times, and between 15% and 20% use two times. Again, <clears throat> it needs to be tested for cash flow for the firm. Now, as you are considering a retirement package uh, for retiring partners, uh, obviously the number of payout periods, how long will the buyout be? Uh, very often we are recommending that firms tie some type of client retention to retirement or succession. You always need to consider the tax structure. Will this be treated as capital gains uh, on behalf of the retiring partner? or as ordinary income. We also are proponents of setting a cap. For example, uh, in larger firms in particular, uh, that cap very often is 15%. And what I mean by that is anytime the total partnership buyout of retiring partners exceeds 15% of the revenue stream, uh, future payments will be deferred of that amount or any amount in excess of 15%. Uh, we're also seeing more and more penalty penalties put into place for premature exit. Uh, we know that it takes two years to properly transition uh, a partner's clients. Anything less than that, very often we will recommend some type of penalties put, be put into place. Uh, that deals with exiting with, without that appropriate notice also. Uh, within every partnership agreement, we tend to insist that you have the ability as a partnership group to expel another partner. Remember, one of the things that you need to be concerned with is the longevity of the firm and its ability to buy out 
uh, the partners in the first place. So we recommend you tie buyouts to retention. You establish a cap on the total buyout. You use vesting to ensure anticipated partner tenure. And there are penalties for lack of notice. And I think that takes us to our final polling question, Nikki. Okay, our fourth and final question is up on the screen now. This question is, does your firm have adequate talent on the bench to replace retiring partners? And here your options are yes and more confident. I think so, but we don't know how to admit them. No, we don't have the talent we need or we don't plan to pursue internal succession. Give everyone about 10 more seconds to answer. One final reminder that you have to answer at least three of the polling questions in order to get your CPE credit today. Okay, we've got nearly everyone's answer. Russ said two uh, responses. We got 56% of people said, no, we don't have the talent we need. And another 44% said, I think so, but we don't know how to admit them. Okay, very good. Let's talk about those new partner admissions. Uh, basically, new partners coming into a firm, obviously the requirements of partnership uh, typically remain outside of the partnership agreement. However, the amount of capital that new partners are expected to put into the firm uh, is something that is very important to cover in a partnership agreement. How much you charge, uh, typically be competitive. You need to uh, apply an upstream career path uh, for your professional talent. Obviously, equity partnership is part of that. You need to de determine as a firm uh, how much equity an individual will be expected to buy in. I will tell you there is a trend within the Southwest and Midwest right now uh, to use partnership buy-in or the amount of capital that a new partner is expected to bring to the table. Uh, usually is what I'm finding predominantly right now is being funded through their compensation. In other words, very often once a new partner is admitted, they're their salary or compensation may increase, or they may be expected uh, to pledge their, their profit uh, sharing, if you will, until their full equity is funded. Typically, new partner equity, uh, we're finding, is being funded over five years. Uh, there are still remain cases where firms may arrange outside financing for a new partner. Uh, to buy in or provide capital to the firm. It's up to you all to determine what's fair. Uh, we would insist or encourage you to consider vesting uh, before a new partner is eligible for any portion of the intangible equity and then make their compensation fair and something that they can be rewarded uh, for the growth of the firm, if you will. What we have found, and this is as a result of the 2013 Rosenberg study, frankly, I was a little shocked by this, but the new partner buy-ins consistently are between 120,000 and 160,000 for all sized firms. Uh, so there definitely is some skin in the game or a capital requirement for new partner buy-ins, which I, I'm old school. I believe this is a very healthy uh, type situation or buy-in or requirement of a new partner. Also, the partnership agreement uh, should deal with termination of a partner. Uh, it should basically require the voting of the partners in place. Uh, there should be clear grounds specified for termination. And then protect, to protect the firm, every partnership agreement should include not to compete and basically a definition of what is cause for termination. Other components of a partnership agreement, uh, typically what we try to do is think through anything bad that could happen for, to a firm. As a result, we encourage you to include as part of your partnership agreement death and disability clauses. Uh, basically, I'm finding firms are gravitating more and more towards key man insurance. Uh, to tell, help fund uh, the loss of a partner or their disability. Uh, partnership agreement should always include some external sale or dissolution uh, 
parameters. Uh, it should always include some type of not to compete, particularly protecting the firm against loss of, loss of clients. It's becoming very commonplace for us right now to recommend as part of a partnership agreement that if a partner leaves the firm and takes clients with them, they will pay the firm for those clients. Uh, they very typically in the, the agreements we write, they may be expected to pay anywhere from 150 to 200 percent of the previous 12 months revenue uh, from that client base. So it needs to address how they leave with and without clients. Very often if a withdrawing partner is vested and would be getting a share of the intangible equity of the firm, very often that is offset with the value of any clients that they may or may not take with them. So at that point, that concludes uh, our presentation on, on partnership agreements. Uh, I am very open to answering any questions that you may all have and would welcome a phone call to clarify anything that we've covered. At that point, I'd like to thank you all very much for your attendance, and I think Nikki will deal with the, our closing parameters here. Great. Thank, thank you, you all you for so attending. Much, Russ. You see Russ's contact information there on the screen. You'll also receive a follow-up email from him either later this week or early next week. You're welcome to reach out to Russ directly with any questions you have about today's content. As far as your CPE certificate, momentarily I'll end the webinar and before you close your browser, be sure to wait a moment. The survey will pop up, just a brief survey. Please provide your feedback for today. And then within the next week or so, uh, within 10 business days, I'll be issuing your CPE certificate. Um, we thank you all so much for attending. As I said earlier, we have uh, webinars every month, so please visit our website to take a look for upcoming webinars. And while you're there, take a look at other articles and resources that we have available. Thank you again.